All right, I'm going to get into 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll pick up from last week. We're calling this series, this is part two of a three-part message. We've titled the message, Facing the Giants. Matter of fact, we're talking about David and Goliath. This is the story. First Samuel chapter 17 is the story of David killing Goliath. And we're learning some lessons from this story of First Samuel chapter 17. Um, let me see, how many people were not here last week? How many heathens were not here last week? Shame on you. Okay, so I got to catch you up, so I'm going to just do a brief review. Matter of fact, I'm not going to call y'all, What I, I normally call y'all um, the jokers. So I'm not going to call y'all jokers anymore. I'll call y'all rascals from now on. <laughs> All of you. Um, David um, goes down to the battlefield where the, the, the army of Israel is faced against the Philistine army. The Israeli army is on one side of the field on a hill. The Philistine army is on another side on the hill. Facing each other, prepare for battle. The Philistine sends out their champion. They call him a champion. His name is Goliath. How many of y'all heard the story of David and Goliath? You really are heathen if you ain't heard that story right there. <laughs> and David, the story says, takes with him five smooth stones and a slingshot and he kills he kills Goliath. Now it's significant because Goliath is about 10 feet tall. He's a big dude. He's a, he's a big rascal. And he's got all this armor on him. I mean, he's got at least 125 pounds of armor that he's carrying, that he's strapped in to protect him. Helmet, I mean, he's got everything on to protect him. And he's got a shield that is so heavy that he has to have an armor bearer carry the shield. This guy is fully prepared for battle. He steps out every day onto the battlefield for 40 days. For 40 days, every day he walks out, every morning and every evening, he steps out to the, on the battlefield and he shouts out to the Israel army, send somebody out here to fight me. And this is what the battle will be. Send your best champion and I'll fight him and whoever wins, the others, the losers will become slaves to the winners. For 40 days, he does that. 40 days, he steps out on the middle of the battlefield, waits for Israel to send somebody, nobody comes. As a matter of fact, the whole army, the generals, the captains, and the king are over hiding in the ditch. Scared. Somebody say scared. They were scared. And Goliath is killed by a little boy named David when he is 17 years young. 17. 17. I say that because young people need to know God can use you to do spectacular things. It's a very significant thing. Matter of fact, here's what I believe about God. I believe the eyes of the Lord searches the planet looking for people that he might show himself strong in. As a matter of fact, that's what the Bible says. The eyes of the Lord look to and fro for somebody through whom he might show himself strong. He wants to find somebody who's got the right traits, the right character, the right temperament, the right posture, the right belief, the right situation, that he might do something so spectacular that when people see what God does in your life, they have to be, they're gonna be jealous of you and say, why you get that? <laughs> Who you know? How you make that happen? And that's what God wants to do. He wants, he, he wants it to be so spectacular that they know you didn't do it. There's no way you could have made that happen. And that's what people say about John Jenkins. They say, how, how does, what is the secret to the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden? No, it's not John Jenkins, it's God. This is God's kingdom, it's God's church. It's, it's God choosing people that he chooses to use that he can show himself strong in. And that's the kind of life I love. I like living this kind of life what God can do the spectacular in my life. So, so the thing that I want to talk through in this series are seven things that David had as a part of his life, seven characteristics, seven principles he lived by that I want to challenge. And I did two last week. Let me review those two real quick. Then I'll hit the other two today. We'll close out next week. This is part two. Let me, let me review these first two with you. The first one, 
deals with the fact that David had responsibilities. Somebody say responsibilities. Say it again, responsibilities. Now, you know, that's a, that's a curse word today. People don't like responsibilities. As a matter of fact, we live in a culture where people want the benefits without the responsibilities. They want, they want the money without the job. They want the sex without the commitment of marriage. Oh, wait, the amens are getting stronger and stronger. That's unusual. That's, that's the culture that we live in today. We don't want no jobs. Go down, play the numbers, hit it big. Win $5,000, you make it for the month. That's how people want to live. They don't want to go to work. They don't want to do this responsibility. They don't want to have responsibility. But God says he honors people who take responsibility. And David was a responsible person. He was a responsible person. In verse number 15, matter of fact, hold up, let me say this. Here's, here's a part of his responsibility. He had a job. Look at your neighbor and say he had a job. He had a job. And here's what his job was. His job was to take care of, when the king got in distress, the king would call for David, and David would come down with his harp, play the harp, and when he played the harp, the distress that King Saul was in would go away. That was his job. That's what he got paid to do. And that's what he would do. But in verse 15, it says, of chapter 17, it says, David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So, so he, he had a job, but he also knew he had a responsibility of going back and taking care of the sheep that his father gave him responsibility for. And so even though he had a job, he knew he had to go back and take care of those sheep. Now this is important because we live in a culture of young people who think that because they got basketball practice, I mean, they don't have to do their chores. I said that last week, that's why y'all not saying amen. Just, cause, just because you got something going on elsewhere doesn't mean that you don't need to clean your room. And it's, it's true for adults too. Just because you got a job or a ministry meeting don't mean you shouldn't be making dinner for somebody when they get home. Look at all the brothers just clapping. And just because you got a job don't mean you shouldn't be cutting the grass. Come on, talk to me for just a second. That grass needs to be cut. God honors people who accept responsibility and fulfill it, whatever it costs. And that's what David did. David made sure that his assignment was taken care of. And, and that's what God looks for, people who can be responsible. We, we, we don't have that today. People make commitments, don't follow through. They got a thousand excuses why they didn't keep, keep their commitment or their responsibilities. And it's very difficult, almost impossible, for God to honor you and bless you when you're not a responsible person. Amen. I, I know y'all weren't going to shout on that. Nobody went to hucking and bucking. Ain't nobody go running around here. Ain't nobody shouting or praising the Lord, but that's true. God rewards you. If you're faithful and little, he can reward you with more. So David demonstrates that in several places in Scripture. I gave that last week. Here's number two. He was obedient. David was obedient. Verse 17 and 18, his father sent him down to take some bread to his brothers, some cheese to the captain, and to check on his brothers. His father gave him an assignment. 17 years old, go down to where the war is going on. 17 years, go down to the streets where the riots are and do this. And without mouth, Without attitude, without sucking his teeth or rolling his eyes, I know I'm teaching right now. When y'all get quiet, I know I'm talking to you. He did it. Scripture says he rose early in the morning and did what his father asked him to do. He did exactly what his father asked him to do as soon as he could do it. He was obedient. Somebody say obedience. That's a very key point. I, I'm trying to get my kids to understand that. When I say do something, I don't mean when you get around to it. I don't mean after you finish playing your game. I don't mean after you get off the phone. I feel in a cussing spirit rising up in me right now.
He looked for the first possible opportunity to obey what his father asked him to do. Some of you will never get ahead in life because you haven't learned how to be submitted to the authorities in your life. As long as you're reserving for yourself the right to decide whether you're going to do it or not, God can never use you. Boy, that's a powerful thing. Y'all y'all not getting that. I'm, that's a major nugget I'm dropping right there. When I was growing up, I wouldn't think about talking back at my parents or rolling my eyes or sucking my teeth or asking questions. If my father said jump, on my way down, I'd be asking him, how high do you want me to jump? Ain't no, why I got to do it? How come so-and-so can't do it? It's their turn to do it. And I'm, I'm trying to help young people and some old people too understand what it takes to get ahead because this is what God looks for. God loves obedient people. Obedience is the key to victory in life. If you can't be obedient, God cannot use you. Look at your neighbor and say, God can't use you, rascal. Unless you learn how to be obedient. Here's number three. I'm going to get number three and number four out of the way. Get y'all out of here. I know y'all tired. This is the 12 o'clock service. I forgot I can take my time. Number three is David had courage. Somebody say courage. Say it again, courage. courage. Look at your neighbor, say courage. courage. Look on the other side, say, did you say courage? Did you say courage? Courage is the quality to face difficult, dangerous, or painful situations without fear. That's what courage is, the ability, the quality, the characteristic to face difficulty, danger, or pain without fear. David had courage. Here's how it's demonstrated. Look at verse 23. I'm right here in chapter 17, 1 Samuel, verse 23. So he gets down to the field. Verse 23, see, he gets down to the battlefield. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. So David gets down to the field, and he sees Goliath marching out to the field. Because remember, he got out early in the morning. He went early in the morning. He got down there. And here comes Goliath spurting out his words. And he spoke according to the same words, so David heard him. David heard him spurting out what he did every morning and every night for 40 days. Send somebody out here. I'll kill them. If they kill me, we'll serve you. If I kill them, y'all serve us. 40 days he did it. And all the men of Israel, verse 24, when they saw the man fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. All of the men, the soldiers, the, the people with all of the armor and weapons are over hiding in a ditch. So then the scripture says, I love, I love this passage right here. So verse 25, so the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Verse 26, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? takes away the reproach from Israel, then, then right there in verse 26, a shift occurs from him asking the question to him making a declaration. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know what he's asking? Why is the army of the living God over hiding in a ditch against this little uncircumcised Philistine? That's courage. That's courage. That man stood up. Now get the picture, y'all. The rest of the army and the king and the captains and the generals are over hiding in a ditch and he sees them and he finds out what's going on and he says, what's going on here? How dare? Who, 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 who is this joker? Who does he think he is? I love it. Somebody say, I love it. I love the word of the Lord. Verse 27, and the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Slide over to verse 32. Can, let me start at verse 31. I'm going to start at verse 31. Can I start at verse 31? I want to start at verse 31. Now, when the words which Do David spoke were heard, they reported them, verse 31, to Saul. 
and he sent for him. He, he, they told the king what David said. So the king asked David to come. Verse 32, then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I'll go. If nobody else got the courage, I'll go. Now this is an important thing because what's keeping a lot of you from doing great things in life is you're afraid, you're wimpish, you have no courage. But if you want to do something spectacular for God, you got to have courage. You have to be willing to stand up in the face of challenge, difficulty, danger. You have to be willing to stand up in the face of something that makes you afraid and say, I'm going to do this. Some of you have never reached the potential that God has for you. He's got businesses inside of you, books inside of you, songs inside of you, uh, all kinds of things inside of you. But because you're so afraid and you're not willing to take a risk or a chance, God cannot achieve anything to you. It's through you because you're afraid. And I'm here to tell you, I'm trying to drive that fear out of you and tell you to rise up and be like David and face your giants. Who here, who's hearing what I'm talking to you? Face your giants, rise up, write that book, start that business, move forward with what God has called for you to do. Face your giants. I love her. I wish I had a hundred women like her, a hundred men like her running around who had the courage to not be concerned about other, what other people think about you. I'm telling you here today, we got some people that God's got an anointing in your life and he wants to do some great things, but you're scared, to, you're afraid of what people gonna say. You gotta stop being worried about other people's opinion about you. Tell your neighbor, stop worrying about what people say. People don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. They can't help you, they can't deliver you, they can't save you, they can't fix what's broken in your life. You better hear the word of the Lord and obey him and do what God told you to do. That's what you better do, do what God told you to do. Rise up and do what God told you to do. Don't be concerned about what they say. Don't be concerned about failing. Trust God to open the door. Trust God to fight the battle. Trust God to give you the victory. Don't be afraid, have courage. Lean over to you now, but he's preaching better than you're saying amen. I love this. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Standing up against the armies of the living God. Some of y'all so afraid of what other people are saying about you and doing to you. You afraid somebody didn't put, if another person comes and say, somebody didn't put a jinx on me or they didn't put some witchcraft on me, shut up. You walking around crying because somebody put a fix or put something on you, shut up. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Can't nobody put no trick on you. You belong to the living God. You are a child of the most high God. Woo. Ridiculous. Be like David. Who is that uncircumcised Philistine? Can't nobody harm you. They can't nothing happen in your life that God has not already approved. He has to approve it. This man has courage. And in my assignment, my job today, now look, 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 let me, can I say one more thing about this point then I'm gonna let it go. The odds were against him. The odds were insurmountable. He had nobody to encourage him. Not a single person encouraged David. Nobody said, go ahead, go for it. Some of y'all want to get an opinion from what you want somebody to stand with you. Hold up. If God be for you, who can be against you? 
y'all don't like this kind of preaching. I'm trying to preach the hell out of you. I'm trying to preach hope in you. I'm trying to preach deliverance inside of you. She ain't tired yet. Keep on running, baby. I love her. Do y'all hear what I'm saying to you today? You know, you know what I discovered? Sometimes you're going to try something and you might not win the first time. But it's okay. Go back again. Come on, tell your neighbor something. Go back another time. Try it again. Figure out what you did wrong and figure out what you need to do different. But don't, woo, don't let one failure stop you from going back at it again, 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 and again. Somebody high five three or four people say he's talking to you right now. I mean, high five them, tell them it's your time, it's your turn, it's your season, it's your moment, it's your opportunity, it's your day. Rise up, have faith, be courageous, don't back down. Forget about what people say and think about you. Have courage. So listen, everybody in here has something in your life that God's told you to do. Something that Christ has called you to do, but you haven't had the courage to step up and do it. We got a lady in our church. She opened a Smoothie King store. in the Bowie Town Center. She doing so well, she about to open up two or three more stores. I'm shouting for her. I'm giving God the praise for her to have the courage. I don't know what God told you to do. Let me tell you something. I try, to, I, I try to live my life by what I preach. I try to be what I preach. I don't always die every eye across every T. I, I miss the mark. I'm not perfect, but I try to live what I preach. Amen. I do. Is that right, honey? Can you, can you, can you testify that that's true? My wife said it's true. I'm going to pay you exactly how much I told you I'm going to pay you when you get home. My, my nature, I'm, I'm by nature, I am an introvert. Quiet, shy, by nature. You would never know that when you see me up here preaching. But in my normal self, I'm quiet and shy and an introvert, normally. But when the power of God comes on your life, he does something inside of you that causes you to behave outside of who you normally are. Now, now listen, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be finished in just a couple minutes. I keep forgetting it's the 12 o'clock service, I can take my time. Uh, when I became the pastor of this church, First Baptist Church, Glen Arden, I did some strange things. I did some things that required courage. So let me, I'm going to start out with some little things. Here's one of the first little things I did. When I became the pastor, all of the older pastors told me, when you do your offering, make the people walk. Make everybody walk. That way you get more money. I'm just telling y'all what they, what they told me. 
And that's what we, we did. We've been marching, and I, I stopped the marching for two reasons. I stopped, first of all, because it's taking 20 minutes to walk around to do a golf. Uh, it was taking too long. But I, I believed that if people are taught what they're supposed to do, they'll do what they're supposed to do, whether they march or not. So we taught, and we teach people. And people gave, and we stopped the marching around. Now, I didn't stop the marching around until we talked to people, but, but when we started attracting unsaved people to church, and some of them came to church dressed like they were going to the club, and the sisters was creating drama in the church <laughs> by the way they was dressing, I got a little concerned. But when one day the pastor said, Jesus, it was time. <laughs> Did I tell y'all that last week? Did I tell y'all that already? Yeah. I was trying to keep my mind on Jesus. And I was having a tough time. I said, can I be honest? I'm trying to be transparent. I know y'all want to think I'm holy and above reproach and above temptation, and y'all think I'm all that, but I'm just trying to be straight with y'all that when my flesh started to rise, it was time to stop the walking. We ain't walked there ever since. That was a courageous move because they said the people give less money. We moved into the ministry center on Brycey Road, which used to be a Heckinger's warehouse. We moved in there, we bought it in 1992, we moved in in 1993. We bought it late 92, refurbished a small portion of it, moved in in May of 1993. It was a warehouse. Back then, churches didn't have warehouse. Didn't, didn't, it's, it's common now, but when we did it, I had to go to Chicago to find one church that had done it. No other church had done it. Very, very few churches had done it. And so what was, what was so courageous about it, because people are used to going to a church, you know, a church building. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, there the people. We didn't have no steeple, we didn't have no glass, we didn't have no stained glass, we didn't have no windows at all. And it was a courageous move to move into a warehouse to be a church. That's what we did, courageous. We built this building. Y'all see this building y'all sitting in right here? We, we did something that most churches, very few churches do, very few in, in the world do, in the country do. We didn't hire a contractor to build this building. We built this building ourselves. We acted as our own general contractor. That was courageous. Somebody say courageous. We try to be courageous. We get a word from God and do what God tells us to do. And even if other people try to talk us out of it and tell us it's not the smart thing to do or the right thing to do, all I need is a word from God to do it and I'm ready to do it. Guess what? We are about to do something that everybody says don't do. We're about to build our Family Life Center, $22 million. Hold up, don't shout yet. We're going to build it ourselves and we ain't going to go to the bank to get any money. We're going to build it with our own money. Somebody say, we're courageous. Someone high five somebody say, be courageous, be courageous. Have courage, have courage, have courage, have courage, have courage. Have courage. I don't know what God's telling you to do, but have courage. I don't know what he's telling you to do, but have courage. I'm almost finished. So, so my point is, David had courage. 17 years old. He steps out on the field to fight Goliath. Now, here's my, third, my fourth point. And I'll pick up next week with the, the final three points. David overcame, this is a key point, rejection. Ooh. Y'all missed it right there. Y'all missed it. 
He overcame. We, nobody, nobody encouraged David. Matter of fact, they, they, they rebuked him. Look at verse 28. Um, in verse 28, then Saul saw and knew that the, no, that's not where I want to be. Now, Eliab, verse 28, his oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. So the older brother saying to the baby brother, you ain't got no business down here. You need to be back up there taking care of those little sheep you got. Your pride brought you down. You think you all that. You think you're such a big shot. I like that. Verse 29, and David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is, it, is there not a reason why God brought me down here? While the rest of y'all chumps are over hiding over in the ditch? There's a reason why I'm down here. Somebody better realize there's a reason why God's calling you to stand up and do something. Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And he said to him, and he sent for him. Verse 32, then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the, this Philistine. Verse 33, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth. And he is a man of war from his youth. His brother rejected him. Now the boss and the king rejected him. Said, you, you ain't qualified to fight this man. Now, why am I t telling you this? Why am I reading this? Because he got, re he got no encouragement. He got rejected. And some of you need to understand that, listen here, rejection goes with the territory. Yeah. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. They're going to tell you a lot, a lot of things. You're too young. You're not qualified. You don't have enough education. You don't have enough experience. There's a lot of things they're going to tell you that you ain't, you ain't, you ain't. But what I discovered, you know, here's what I discovered. I discovered that God likes to use people who are unqualified. Yeah. Oh, I can't get no amens right there on that point. As a matter of fact, Here's what I discovered in my life. This is so important. If y'all don't remember anything else that you hear me say today, or even in this series, remember this. That rejection is a sign, an indicator from God that he does not want you to fit in with them. Y'all missed it, y'all. She's still running. Somebody said she's still running. She got a partner now, she got a partner. I'm believing there's somebody here today who's been feeling rejected, feeling put out. Now there's a reason why God does not want you to fit in. You are a square peg trying to make your way into a round hole. You're trying to be accepted by everybody, but God don't want you to be accepted. You know why? Because when God elevates you to where he's going to take you, he don't want nobody to try to take credit for it. Hey! Woo! Who am I preaching to today? They want to try to take credit. They're going to try to say they made you. They helped you. They got you their start. No, no, no. God don't want you to fit in. So when he elevates you, nobody but God gets the credit. Somebody high five your neighbor say, can't nobody but God get the credit. I say high five somebody say, can't nobody but God get the credit. Laugh at me, talk about me, reject me, call me names, it's all right. God elevated me. God called me up. God engaged me. God delivers me.
man, I wish I had somebody to help me preach. I wish I had somebody who understood what I was saying. When I was, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, I got, I didn't fit in. I was a Christian in a non-Christian school community. They didn't invite me to parties and they didn't come to mind. Oh, they got a train going on now, y'all. then what I know now and what I know now is that when people reject you it means God's got something special for you to today. They laughed at you, talked about you, hated on you, rejected you, but it's all right. God got something special for you. neighbor say you special God's got something special for you. don't cry stop crying because you ain't been accepted stop crying because they rejected you stop crying because they fired you stop crying because they quit you stop crying because they didn't vote for you didn't pick you didn't invite you to their celebration it's okay you don't want to fit in you're not supposed to fit in God has called you to do something special. And guess what? When you get rejected by men, you are in good company because there was one who was rejected by men, a man acquainted with sorrow. Hallelujah. He was the chief. He was the stone which the builders rejected and he became the chief cornerstone. Somebody ought to pray. 
praise him. Somebody ought to give him some thanks. Somebody ought to say, God, I thank you. I didn't know what it meant when I got rejected. I didn't know what it meant when they laughed at me and talked about me and lied on me. But now I know. Now I know. Hey. Hey. I welcome it now. I accept it now. I celebrate it now. Call me names. Call me crazy. Say what you want. But I am a child of the most high God. I'm a child of the King. Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise his name. You're special. If you're going to get where God wants you, you're going to have to learn to overcome rejection. Tell the neighbor that. Tell them. Tell two or three people, you got to learn to overcome rejection. Tell them two or three sides. You got to learn. You're going to have to learn. You're going to have to learn. You got to stop crying. Stop complaining. Stop feeling bad. You got to embrace it. That that simply means God's got something special for me. Who am I preaching to? Who is this for? Is it for anybody? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. They laughed at me. They talked about me. They said I wasn't qualified. They said I wasn't old enough. But God, look at what you've done in my life. Let's worship the Lord. Let's just praise his name. Let's just give him thanks. From the depths of our heart, let's just thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Hallelujah. Maybe you haven't been rejected yet, but your day is coming. If you're going any place, you're going to need courage, and you're going to need to overcome being talked about and rejected. It goes with the territory. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. 
You're an awesome God. I bless your name. Thank you for every blessings. Thank you for the power of your word. I pray right now, Lord, somebody will walk out of here today with the courage to do what you told them to do. Rebuke fear. Rebuke the concern about danger or whatever issue, Lord, pain that they're concerned about. Give them the courage to overcome and do what you have said. And give us, Father, the ability by the power of your might, by the anointing of your presence, to stop looking for acceptance from people and learn that rejection means you have something special on our agenda. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.